<laughs> Here we go. Voila. Uh, this is Nate Simmons. I'm very happy to have him. He's from France. Uh, he uh, did his PhD at the uh, uh, Santa Santa Barbara, uh, then postdoc at CNRS. Uh, uh, and what else did I want to say? Oh, can I tell you the good truth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's, uh, he's, he'll be starting in the fall at the University of Oregon as a tenure track professor. So, um, <laughs> very happy to be here. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, some of the research I've done on, on historical linguistics. Uh, for a language called Arma. Um, so just what I want to accomplish is to talk about Arma, uh, give an introduction to it, talk about the empirical materials, and to look at some concrete things and the phonology of the language, uh, looking at some of the consonants, the vowels, a little bit of tone, uh, and, and so mostly about the what we can reconstruct about the, the consonants of the language. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the morphology of the language and something I think will be interesting is to talk about this directional um, in a historical perspective. So, Irma is a trans Himalayan language, a uh, language complex, a group of dialects, um, spoken along the upper Min River in Sichuan, China, by about 70,000 people of Qiang and Tibetan nationalities. So Qiang is the language in Chinese. Um, so, here is Sichuan, China. Uh, the red counties on this map are places where Irma is spoken. Um, and the general prefecture is the, the yellow and red together. So just those five counties in uh, northwestern Sichuan. In terms of the, the relationship of the language to other languages, it's part of the burmo chamic branch of tibeto burman And this is the structure of the family tree. So we see uh, lolo Burmese on one side, including Burmish and Burmic. And we're looking at the non-Chamic part of burmo chamic And within that, there's a group called Chamic. And there are probably a half dozen languages that get grouped in with Chinese. So uh, we can kind of look to see uh, through reconstructing Arma, how can we bring this uh, into the bigger picture of its relationship with other languages in the area. So here's just another quick map. Uh, these areas down here in the south are speaking Chiang. Um, the southern varieties are much more internally diverse than the northern varieties. And this is a barrier here where there's kind of an arbitrary boundary between a line where people become Tibetan at some point, going up the river and after a certain county line, everyone here is Tibetan and everyone here is another ethnicity, but they're speaking dialects in the same language. So just to be clear about that, Burma is kind of a amalgam of all the different names that people call themselves. Jiang is the, the Chinese name that Burma is to look at. So just, uh, I'll be talking about some different varieties today and to give an idea, um, the more important ones I think to Remember for this would be Rongxi here, a uh, Yonghe, which I've studied uh, the most, and then Ronghong here. So we kind of use three different points of um, these uh, dialects that we have just to kind of show the diversity of the number of dialects in total, and then the the varieties that we actually have documented. So there's quite a lot of documentation uh, to do for Irma as well. Okay, so then within Irma, how do we? Um, Characterize the different dialects. I think there are three branches uh, that are non northern. So, northern is a real branch of Burma, and there's northeastern and northwestern. And then the southern group is really just the non northern group. So, we have one southwestern group, a southeastern group, and then Longxi is kind of the out group. So, this um, structure will help us to determine what to reconstruct as well. If we find something that's just in these two varieties, we think, well, maybe it's an innovation. If something is found in Wongxi, Yanshu, and Yongfa, then there's more evidence for pushing that back further up the tree. So there's no written tradition for the language. Um, we don't have any texts uh, written in other languages um, uh, into Tibetan or anything like that, like we do for uh, other languages. Um, the earliest transcriptions are in Chinese, uh, with maybe 200 words in a Chinese word list using Chinese to write the language. There are some transcriptions um, by Hobson, who's a British naturalist in the 1800s. He did a, about a 200 word word list, but the variety is not very informative for historical linguistics, partially because of the time depth, but also the variety itself is just not that um, interesting in that way. Okay, so we can learn about history of the language also through bones from Tibetan and Chinese. Uh, Chinese transliterations of local names. Um, some are my religious texts, which maybe potentially archaic. So my, 
my goal here is not to give a definitive reconstruction of the language, but to kind of give the tools necessary that would be used to, to do the reconstruction. So these are kind of the, the resources we have. Uh, but we also have job only languages, which are crucial um, because they're very conservative, uh, including Tungut, which is attested uh, um, from the 11th century. We have the Burmese side of that family tree has a long written tradition, and some of the other languages within Burma Chang. Um, there's also some reconstructions of like Proto Persuic, which we can use as well. Um, but the problem is that Burma is a phonologically progressive suburb. Um, so we lose all the consonant codas. And then we lose many of the complex onsets. So just to give an example, here's the Tibetan word for eight, which is Pergyad, I guess, yeah, um, Pergyad, um, and versus Taoping or Che. So we see a real reduction there. We've lost the D is gone. The Arya part has become a Cha. Um, there's, there's a lot of change there. So these are not uh, trivial changes. It's really huge restructuring of the, of the basic syllable shapes. Um, especially for diasonic forms, as we'll see. So this is a, a typical inventory for an Arma variety. Um, I don't think this is representing any one variety, but this is what we typically find in terms of consonants. You'll find a three-way distinction in voicing uh, between um, B, P, and B, for example, for all the onsets except for uvulus. You'll find a three-way distinction in um, affricates. We have something like Z, J, and Z. Some also have a tra. Um, uh, my, my thinking is that maximally you would have three series of Africans as a proto language. Uh, there's a large set of fricatives. Um, I think that most of these can be reconstructed. That the X here is probably um, just certain varieties have weakened K in certain positions, and so it's not really funny. Um, most everything is pretty straightforward for the onsets. Um, so we can look at, for example, proto or well, we reconstruct a simple voiceless onset based on nothing to the contrary. So there's certain cases where uh, pu will unite in inner vocalic position, and then bu will unite as well. So we kind of see it's really clear for things like the onsets of the bu bu bu. Um, we also have evidence for this voicing series in loans from Chinese. So here's some voiced words, words with voice onsets in our mind. That come from Chinese. Chinese then lost the voicing, so we know these are kind of by Chinese law. So this gives evidence for this kind of uh, voicing distinction at the earlier stages. Although there are some some uh, one-off changes, especially for longxi. So we see a, a loss of distinction between fla and sa, and a loss of distinction between retroflex and non-retroflex. So the longxi here is really not giving us as much information. Longxi is generally very conservative and trustworthy. But in this case, it's, it's kind of, we need uh, additional information to figure out how to reconstruct it. Um, so some Arma varieties have these labialized onsets, um, which uh, would form another set of consonants. So you have this large set of consonants and now all the labialized consonants as well. So potentially those should be reconstructed based on correspondences with Tonga here, with other Jaronic languages like Spu, and potentially Chinese. I'm not as sure about all of these correspondences, but it seems like there's a, a, a vigilized element um, that corresponds with other languages that should be reconstructed also. We see a, a big reduction in complexity of complex onsets uh, in our month. So for Mao, you have something like Shpi and Yonga Pia, Shpa, Papo, Rbu, O, and so on. So losing the first of two consonants is very common in the southern varieties. <clears throat> also, we find varieties where there's just a change from a complex onset into an affricate. So from xa to tsa, and you find many changes like this, xa uh, to tsa. So that's another kind of simplification, not losing the consonant, but uh, changing a complex onset into a simplex one that's an affricate. Um, yeah, so these are, uh, there's another variety, wrong home. This is a, a sound correspondence described for wrong home where we don't have a complete deletion, but we have Clinician of these, so we have kusa, shushch, and a suku, words like this, where we have a, a weakening of the constant. So in these cases, we just reconstruct the non weakening of the constant. All right. Um, yeah, so we can also look outside of the Raman, look at the Jaromic languages, and see that these consonant clusters are conservative. Uh, 
it's not that they've been innovated in talping or not. So Mantra and talping are the Yerma varieties. They have this difference. But the conservative Jaronic language, Jaffa, looks more like talping. So we could reconstruct something uh, based on this to say that these are really old uh, constant clusters in these cases. There's a, a list of kind of problems in earlier work on proto Yerma where uh, Jonathan Evans went through and, and tried to do a reconstruction. Um, and he did the best he could with the data he had at the time, but there's certain um, reconstructions that he gives which lead mul to multiple correspondences in the daughter language. So this is what we don't want, because uh, we don't know when is snub becoming, becoming nub and when is it becoming d in the answer, for example, or these three different changes in topic. So this I just list here as something somebody should follow up on, look at these consonants to see uh, what's going on with them. So yeah, especially the ones with S as an initial, I would say, are particularly problematic. Um, although uh, there are certain, so, so here's Wongshi, for example. In, this is really tiny, I'm sorry. In Jaffa, we see all of these have uh, fricative plus no clusters, like shna and shna. And in Wongshi, we see a D, so that's okay. But then with shnez, the word for seven, we get a shi. So there's a real a problem with uh, Longxi snub clusters, I would say. There's some, something to be figured out there um, as a problem to be solved. Uh, for the vowels, um, the vowel systems are pretty similar across varieties. You see um, a high and uh, this uh, high front unrounded, high front rounded vowel, a bard eye, and um, ooh, two mid vowels, a schwa and a, is really common for Longxi. Uh, for Rongkong, we see a, a difference here where we added an additional vowel, um, um, and we've lost the, the bar I. So the, the vowel correspondences don't um, cause as much problems, although there's this change shift that happens in the history of the language, such that you have the same vowels, but they, the, the correspondences have shifted. So in uh, Longxi, you get A, but in uh, Rongkong, you get E, and in Longxi, you would get O, and then Rongkong, you would get O. So there's this huge change, you know, shift that happens that we have to kind of unwind as we do these comparisons. Looking at tone, um, another important feature of the language, um, most varieties have a two-way distinction. So not like Chinese where you have multiple tones, but just two simple tones, high versus low. Most varieties have this distinction. Some don't have this distinction. So I would reconstruct this. I'd say, okay, well, we just have a, maybe we don't call it high and low, but it's type one, type two, or AP or something. Um, and here, uh, there's some non tonal varieties that do have specialized vowels. So they have um, uvularized and non uvularized vowels. And I think that there's a correlation between the, the vowels and the tones, such that they really come from the same uh, source, or the, the distinction comes from the same source. So just looking at these examples here, we have a high tone in Wongxi, and we have a plain vowel in Hongya, which is a variety with these different vowels. So the high tones correspond to the plain vowels. And the low tones correspond to these uh, uvularized vowels. So it's kind of a dark vowel quality, something like all or something like that, uh, I suppose. Um, so there's a, a, a correlation between the vocalic type and the tone type. Um, and we only need to reconstruct one. So there's some sort of uh, super segmental distinction at the earlier stage. So here's a minimal pair where we have so and so versus so and so. Um, something like that, where there's a couple minimal pairs for this. Um, the lowest varieties with the tongue are actually more conservative because they preserve this distinction in all cases where in Hongi and here you have two uh, onsets with uvulars and they can't not have uvular vowels, they have to have the uvularized vowels. So this, this shows that Wongxi is actually giving us more value here, there's more information on the side of Wongxi. Okay. Uh, yes, and there's some, some varieties which don't have either the vowel distinction that I talked about or this tonal distinction. So they just have the same vowels here. Su, learned, and cannabis. Su are the same as uh, homophones, um, like, uh, yes, with the same, same vowel and uh, life tones. All right. So now we'll look at um, a little bit of the disallotic forms and how. The bigger picture for how words are structured and how this has changed over the language. I think this is uh, uh, 
something people have not written about before, and I find interesting. So Bongxi, again, is our conservative kind of uh, shining light, and it's more tonal than in other varieties. So in Bongxi, you can have a low tone and a high tone, so low high, high low, high high, or low low. So all four combinations for the two tonal categories. So when we compare this with another variety, we find that the tonal correspondence is regular. So we have Musi and Musi, um, low high, low high, and then Huda, Hude, high low and high low. But in uh, Yonghe, the high highs have become high low. So we get Tsute for K, and then the low lows have become low high. So Wasa for monkey. So there's, you take a four-way distinction, you boil it down to a two-way distinction. For Yonghe, there's really only a high-low versus low-high difference, and Longxi has this more conservative four-way contrast. Another dialect we ensure um, has a three-way contrast. Um, and we can look at this and see that it has the same patterns for Yonghe and in the low highs. Low high, high-low, no problems. But um, it patterns with Longxi, in terms of the uh, low low forms, and it patterns separately from either of these in changing high high into low high versus high low. So we have a split here where we would have a four way distinction preserved in low C, you have a merger here in Minshu, and you have a merger in Yonko. So if we, if we took a Yonko word, we wouldn't really know should we reconstruct this as high low or high high because it could be either. We would really need to know. Either a combination of the value of the word in Yonga and Nyanshu or the value in Longshi to be certain of the, the reconstruction. There's other varieties, so Lobo Jaya has, I won't go through each of these individually, but you can kind of see how um, these are variations. So Lobo Jaya is the same as Nyanshu, except for it subsequently changed the high low into a high high. You know, this, uh, this additional twist and Taoping is, is more complex. So there's there's various ways where you can go from this four-way distinction to more simpler terms, um, and it works that way rather than to try to go the other way around. It's, it's more complicated. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so Pushi is an atonal variety uh, spoken in the southwestern Lee County, and it lacks all tonal distinctions whatsoever. So how did it get to be that way? Um, we can look at Hongxi as our four-way distinction, Taoping as an intermediate stage, and then Kushi as the final product, where we have low high becomes low high, that's fine, and it becomes uh, stressed on the second syllable. So this is the accent here. So we have Nessa, I guess, uh, Bashi. Um, so we have low high becoming a, a weak, strong stress pattern. We have the high low becoming uh, a weak strong stress pattern as well, which is bizarre. But in Taoping, the high low became low low, and then the low lows differentiated a little bit. So the first low was lower than the second low. So you have three one, three three, and this got reinterpreted as uh, weak and then strong. So then you have a uh, weak strong syllable structure here. The high highs became high low in Taoping, and they continued to evolve just into a collapsed monosyllable. In Kushi, where you get this nice crunchy word for September um, from two syllables to last. And then the low low is uh, pattern this way. So in, in Kushi, you really only have a two way difference between this kind of collapsed syllable type and the non collapsed syllable type. So there's not as much information in Kushi to try, or in Kushi to, try to figure out uh, what the original system is. So it looks something like this where you have just a two way. Okay, so then uh, in the Northwest, uh, the Mao varieties, they've um, done a similar thing where they've collapsed monosyllables, uh, disyllables into monosyllables. Um, and so here's the examples of that. So we have this high low distinction, um, becomes just a monosyllable. And then and so on. And then mus, muk, push, that wish. So all of these. Went from high high to high low to then just one syllable. So that's how you can lose tones to, to change the, the contrast onto that of the syllable structure. For the forms which have low initial, so low high and low low, 
in mole, we just get a disyllable with no real pitch pattern to speak of. So it's not that these are tonal, but they, they just don't contrast with these anymore because they're they're separate syllable structures. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so we can schematize this and say we have high low becomes a monosyllable, low high becomes kind of a disyllable. Um, and you can think of this as one change where this change kind of results in these being uh, not contrasted with anything else. So we have these um, list of changes. I won't go through each of these, but this is just to kind of give proof that each one of those nodes on the tree that I showed earlier is validated by one of these innovations. So, so except for long sheet, which I can't find any tonal changes for, I based that tree on these uh, correspondences. So Mantra and Wobajai, they share an innovation. Wobajai has an additional change. Uh, Pushi um, has an additional change on top of Taupe here, for example. So we, we can kind of see the, the um, divergence from uh, Wong Shi. All right, looking at codas then, um, from, from the tone, uh, it's not clear that we can really reconstruct any codas for Proto or not. Um, maybe it needs a lot more work. Uh, but here we can see that conservative language like Tibetan has common codas here. Um, Rum, for example, or Vercel. Uh, Guillaume Jacques says that these are cognates, this on forms with O in Japu, and this would be cognate with O in Longshi in these forms, and U in Rongong. So we had that change from O to U. Um, but uh, I think these are parallel innovations uh, for Japu and Longshi. I don't think this is a, a common change that they lost these codes to O together, uh, because Proto Japu would have still had the codes. So, Probably parallel innovations, which makes it a bit complicated. Um, but yeah, we, we can look to um, more conservative languages to find where the photos uh, drop and what the result may have been. All right, so now I have um, the rest of this to talk a little bit about the non phonology portion, which I think is more exciting. Uh, there's these prefixes in Armada that go with verbs, and they have to, you have to say them. So uh, this is a, a typical inventory of these prefixes where there's eight, um, and you have up and down, towards and away from a center, in and out of something, and then upriver and downriver. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about these and how they work. Um, here's an example from the Yonko variety of Vermont, just a spoken a narrative that shows these directional prefixes and how they're used. So we have this first sentence, So here it's downriver. So I went downstream, there's a lot of This is a literal direction, because he could have been going from somewhere else, or, or by another way. Uh, I, I met a ghost, or I bumped into, I met up with a ghost, where this is acting as a perfective marker, not really any literal direction. And then we have, uh, so, because I got scared. So this is the away from center prefix, um, which is functioning as a perfective, uh, but has its semantics from this away. He got scared away, or he, uh, you know, scared something out of me. There's a lot of kind of English coefficients there, like similar things we can do with racial verbs that look like these listen up, quiet down, and so on. But in this language, it's, it's a way to race. So it's used in the perfective. So I'll look at one of these pairs of Directional prefixes and see what we can say about it up to Proto Roman. So there's this Z prefix, which has been called a lot of different things. Cislocative towards speaker, clockwise, rightward, towards the river. So these, these labels are different, but I, I believe they all have a similar core semantics. The da one is out from the center like this, and the, the other one is in towards the center. Um, so let's look at some examples of these prefixes. And there are fixed collocations with verbs and see if we can kind of get a sense of these semantics. So these are just verbs in Bongshi or Ma, which take the da away prefix. So we have make noise, to unfold, release animals, dissolve, blend, three things that happen in this direction generally, I would say. Um, and we have things which are fixed collocations but don't really have to do with space. So to have a bitter taste in your mouth, I can't imagine 
a spatial meaning for that, uh, other than it's just the perfected form of the verb. To be crazy, maybe uh, he went, went away crazy or something. There's something there. Fear, okay. Um, so for each of these, it's kind of tricky, case by case, to look and see if you can convince yourself if there's an etymological reason for these prefixes. Um, here's another variety. We have shoot, catch on fire, flee, land, expand, to die something, an earthquake, to scatter. So all of this is a way kind of semantics, I think, pretty clearly. Some cases where there's not really so clear semantics, uh, to shrink, I think, is the opposite of expansive. Um, to get something, to buy something, I, I don't see those as having the same semantics, and we'll see a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but there's some kind of semantics to do with crossing as well, traversing a, uh, going across some sort of boundary. Okay, uh, just another one of these varieties, just to show that the, the vowels of this dialect have changed a lot depending on uh, its environment. So we have, to, we, we look at Longshi, it's all odds, and then this one is a bit of a mess. So, uh, long, long, same thing, kind of away, outwards, cements, to die, to spread, to release, to exit. Um, and the opposite prefix, the fourth one, to quench up your fist, to fold an umbrella, put on clothes, to buy something, all things that have action towards the center. So it's the s, s prefix. Which we talked about the z in in Wonchi comes from both z and z and z. So we would have to see what to read the correct form for this is based on other evidence. Uh, in in Hong Kong we have zu and z. Uh, it's zu zu to assail someone from all directions. Uh, z ji to get hit, not from, from any direction I guess. The by uh, towards the center. So these are there's less of these towards ones than there are the other way. So I think that's interesting also. Probably more conducive to a grammaticalized perfected meaning, something like a way than something like towards. Or it could just be a, a, a just an accident. So here's the, the kind of schema for these. The, left, the one on the right should have arrows pointing inwards. Um, but you can imagine a right handed person kind of sowing seeds, and this would be away from self, clockwise, and rightward all at the same time. And if somebody was collecting grain, Maybe they would be doing something uh, in the opposite direction. So uh, this is what I think are the four semantics to the extent that that's possible uh, for these two prefixes. And they're in the opposite order here. So this would be the z, and this would be the da, away. Right? And I think that these form an opposition in the language as early as proto Vermont because you find these constructions like to do something back and forth, or do something this way and that, like true. Like in Chinese, you have uh, the word for go, for example, might be la. So you have la to go this way and that. Um, so I think this suggests that these form kind of a nice pair uh, in different subgroups of Vermont. So in local and local, not just in one subgroup. Um, to compare this with orientational prefixes in another language, um, uh, there is this neutral prefix in trust jobs, which I think is cognate with this uh, so I'll try to show that. Um, and this here in trust chapter has neutral semantics, which kind of fits with the idea that we have something which is away, and that semantics which we should become the general effect for. So this says neutral, it doesn't have any real spatial import in trust jobs. Um, but we need to look at not only the prefixes, but the prefix specific prefix uh, verb parents. So if we look at the verb to fear. In all the varieties of Rama, except Pushi, we have the away form. So Pushi uses the upwards prefix. He got scared up by something, or something that he got shook up. Um, but I think this is innovative, and then this is conservative, since we have can't block it all the other So I would say here should be a doubtful kind of reconstruction. Okay, same for the word for flee. So Flee takes the translocative in all these varieties, except for pushy, where it's kapu outwards. So I, I have to think that pushy is kind of on its own here. Uh, we have a verb like hit, which has all the evidence pointing towards da. So I, I would just reconstruct da wa, I guess. Um, this one is interesting. The word for forget has the translocative in most, 
But then in some varieties, it's been replaced with the inwards marker. In Yoga, it's been replaced with the downwards marker. So I would reconstruct the translocate in this basic and saying these are innovations uh, for these. These got re rematched with another orientation. Um, and you can kind of see these, the, the syllable structure thing we talked about earlier, into Dabu, two nice syllables here, and then Dire, or just Dan. So there's a quite, quite a difference from uh, in terms of the, the syllables. And then this word for tired, uh, this is less clear, I think. We have conflicting evidence upwards, downwards, and translocative. These I'm, I'm not as sure about, um, but kind of needs more work. Each verb would have to be done this way, looked at across varieties. So here's the verb to buy, which in most varieties takes the towards prefix. So I think that is original. And then it got replaced with upwards in Pusi or with away in Gensha, where away in Gensha is more of a general um, a perspective than, than having a real translocal. Okay, last, uh, then we have this verb to die, which I think is really complicated. You have here in Longchi, it's got a downwards prefix. In this northwestern subgroup, it's got the away prefix. Here it has inwards, uh, inwards again. I'm, I'm not really sure what to do with this one. I'll say for now that it's uh, translocative. That's not, yes, um, let's see. There's a, there are cases where we have one words from Chinese also. So this is a one word Chinese uh, verb tool to be wrong. Um, has the translocative prefix in most varieties, but it's been replaced in Pusi and in Taoping. Pusi did it with the downstream prefix, Taoping with the upwards prefix. Uh, so it, this kind of confirms to me that Pusi is really kind of innovative. It's innovative with local form, native forms and with, with um, long words as well. So I would really check this with a, a dot orientational prefix. Uh, looking beyond for Armand to see, okay, how does this fit these prefixes with other languages? Evans has suggested that this Armanda would possibly cognate with tongues, da, and with kumi ta away. So I, I like the first comparison, I don't think the second one works. Um, the tongue prefix da has been noted as having no directional semantics, it's a perfected marker. Um, or it's been called a case of a neutral directional prefix. There is a closely related language to Tango called Yeshita, which um, has a prefix da with the exact same um, the onset and with, with the similar semantics of being orientational and neutral. And the, the crucial thing, I think, is that there's forms with the da prefixes that are cognates in all three groups. So if we look at these words here, to forget, um, to die, and to move. I'm not saying these are my final answer reconstructions of proto Hermann, but if we reconstruct these verbs as having the da prefix, it fits really nicely with the dish da prefix where you get da wu, da sa, da wu. And here we would have something like da da wu or something. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I don't, don't want to uh, commit to these, but these are just, uh, I'm committing only to reconstructing the prefix in the slot. I guess I would say. And then we have this verb to become, which is nicely with Tongbit uh, as well. I'm not a Tongbit expert, so I'm sure there's people who could uh, kind of find, find more cognates or, or maybe correct some of these cognates, but I think it's worth uh, looking into. So um, this means that there's, uh, it's, it's validates this way, basically. You have a, um, a close relationship between Arma and Jaromic, I would say, in this uh, away prefix. Uh, which we don't see in Ursui, for example, we don't see in uh, Uya, for example. So just to give a quick look at the inventory of things from other, other language groups, here's this uh, tree structure. So we have Ursui and Chang'e, and the ones inside it. And Ursu has um, no real overlap with Irma, so that, that, that makes sense. Irma, has an innovative form for down. So let's get to the forms. Here's our da away prefix, which is coming with tongues, yes, and ja. So both of the trust jobs as well. Um, we see job book has innovated some directional prefixes. It's not as informative. And I think that there's a, an interesting thing going on with this ta away prefix in her um and uya. So that could. Means to say, well, maybe first, Muya 
and it will be the long distance port of the plate. Or it's through contact. If you look at the, the um, geographical relation, this is a terrible map. I'm really sorry to have to show it. It's got a lot of inaccuracies, but it does have this nice uh, portion of um, showing Ursu here, two different Muya varieties, and Kumi. They're all in the same area. These are all Ursuic varieties. So I'm more tempted to think there might be a, an explanation for this uh, away prefix as being a, an innovation or a parallel development across those. Um, but I think that the, the um, main contribution here would just be say that the, the da away prefix fits nicely with this other away prefix. For more examples of that. So I'm, I, I was kind of half skeptic about Chang'e for a long time. I thought it was a rat bag. But now I think there's there's more to be done to kind of uh, untangle, especially for these uh, lesser studied languages that really don't know that much. So I think it's um, kind of uh, representative of where we're at now. For, for yes, so to conclude, uh, Northwestern varieties, if, if you were to reconstruct Proto Armani, you would need a Northwestern variety for their complex onsets. You would need Wongshi for the vowels and the tones. You would want to look at the southern varieties for the syllable structure. Um, and uh, yeah, some of these, these syllable structure changes. And also uh, to look at cross varieties, I think it's important to look at cross varieties, looking at one verb and seeing which prefix it takes to take some of the cross variety rather than just looking at the prefixes uh, by themselves. So uh, that's, I think, all I have to say. Thanks very much. Uh, for your